Please join me in giving Steve Harrod a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. So thank you all for uh, coming today. I want to thank John Todd for uh, coercing me into doing this presentation. So I think there was a free exchange of coffee though, so perhaps it wasn't coercion after all. So he's also responsible for this rather provocative uh, title. Oh, here, I was paid in a 2020 Donald Trump note. <laughs> this is the official fiat currency of the Pachyderm Club at this point, so. But I want to thank you all again. It's, you know, it's unusual for me to be back at the Petroleum Club when I was a young man. This is where I would come and have conversations with my father, who's sitting over in the corner. And they were typically about my grades. I, did, I didn't usually come down here for celebrations, so it's nice to be back at the Petroleum Club. And it's nice to be on this side of the, of the podium and have the clicker this time. So anyway, thank you. As, as uh, John said, I've spent most of my life in marketing, you know, what, what I, if I'm good at any one thing, it's starting a conversation and seeing patterns. And so what really I'm trying to talk to you about today is a pattern. Uh, I don't really want to try to educate you on technology as much as what I see going on and why you should all pay attention to it. You know, generationally we're seeing sweeping changes with technology occur and that's really what I want to communicate to you, why you should begin having a discussion about it and why it's going to become increasingly important. So John told me that uh, we can measure success today if we upload this video that we're filming onto YouTube and we potentially get it censored. That obviously I've talked about liberty and I'm a dangerous person. If you don't realize it, everybody in this room, Facebook would consider being a dangerous person. Uh, that's actually their stated policy. If you talk about politics, if you talk about liberty, you're considered a dangerous person. And what does that mean? You could actually make threats against a dangerous person on Facebook and have that be totally legal. And I'll talk about some of the ethics and legality of that towards the end of the presentation. I definitely want questions and answers. If, if anybody is just really stuck, there's no uninformed questions today, so just raise your hand. I am saving about a good 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, though, if you, wanna, if you wanna wait. So either way, what, what is technology? I mean, we have all these buzzwords that we're gonna talk about today, but fundamentally, I always like to tell people, technology is like a hammer. I mean, what can you do with it? You could build a house with it. You could smash your finger with it. You could potentially assault somebody with it, right? It's a piece of technology, it's a tool that we use. And so a lot of times, I think when we talk about technology, and we especially hear this from Silicon Valley, I think there's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of technical terms that distract from the real issues. Ultimately, we're talking about a tool that we as humans use for our purposes. And, I, and I'm gonna really key today on why I think that's changing a little bit and why we should uh, pay attention to it. So I, I try to find an analogy that I think all of us can wrap our heads around, even the ones that don't really understand technology. One of my favorite books from the latter part of last decade, I guess, or last century, I should say, was Playing God in Yellowstone. And it was a good example of how good intentions with federal government intervention went awry and nearly extinguished things like elk and buffalo and all these other things in Yellowstone Park. And in the process of trying to correct it, right, different things happen. Well, there's too many elk, let's introduce coyotes. Coyotes wipe out the elk. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? And uh, decades and decades of this poor central planning, and again, good intentions of, of the planners went awry and nearly, nearly exterminated a lot of life in Yellowstone Park that took you know, many years to recover from. So one of the author's quotes in there is, when the search for truth is confused with political advocacy, then the pursuit of knowledge is reduced to the quest for power. So we're just gonna kind of walk through, you know, some of what I'm seeing at a very high level and, and kind of draw it into this analogy towards the end. Really great book, if you haven't read it in years, it's, it's really worth uh, revisiting. So. We may just be talking about this book the rest of the presentation. So, um, so let, me, let me talk a little bit about knowledge because that's really what we're talking about. When we go on the internet, 
when we search something on our phone and now increasingly we talk to our phone we're looking for knowledge we're looking for information right we're looking to find a restaurant we're looking to find a book etc so how did we used to find that information most of us in this room found it in the educational system probably in a library right you got exposed to ideas I had a professor that was a socialist I went and read some other books and found out, well, maybe that's not the only way, right? I, our good friend George Pearson, uh, who's also plotted against me with Mr. Todd to have me here today, uh, exposed me to the Cato Institute. I was an intern after college at the Cato Institute on Capitol Hill. I was exposed to a lot of ideas, and those ideas came from books, right? So this was the foundation of critical thinking, right? What started to happen? you know, later in, the, cent in, in uh, the century past. Radio crept into our houses, right? Television crept into our houses. There was people at the time saying, oh, this could be a terrible thing. I think most of us thought, hey, it's entertaining, right? We've, the family's around. We've got, we got information now coming into our house. So back then, and this is kind of a key marketing principle. Ironically, this is from a Google presentation. Reach was scarce and attention was plentiful. For example, one of the three major television channels could beam a program into your house and you would pay attention to it, right? There wasn't a lot of competition for your attention. So what do we have now? We have the flip of that now. Reach is plentiful. All of us in this room probably have a mobile phone, right? So these things can get to us, but our attention is now what's scarce, right? And if any of you have a teenager, you know that attention is scarce and at a premium right now. This is probably what most of our schools now look like. This picture is actually in a hallway of a high school. A lot of teachers, you know, talk about this and struggle with this. It's not necessarily all bad, but there's definitely some consequences to it, right? And so when we talked about the information superhighway in the late 90s, that was a big word that was buzzed about, the Google search bar became the way to really get onto that highway, right? <laughs> A lot of us still use this. You may use something different, right? There's different search engines out there. Google's the dominant one, and we're gonna talk about how dominant that is. But this was your entry point. This is how you got in. This is how you asked questions. You may ask, what is liberty, right? You may ask, where's Pizza Hut? These, this is the way you got that information, right? Increasingly, it's becoming this what's called a smart speaker. And I am gonna say at the end, always be aware of something that's labeled smart <laughs> on the front. That's, if, you, if you remember nothing else, just be aware of that. But smart speakers are now coming into our homes, they're coming into our cars, and they're answering questions. Typically not open-ended questions, right? And are they typically giving you a bunch of answers? No, they're typically giving you one answer, right? And so that's, that's something we're also gonna talk about. So how big is this? You know, how, how big is this reach as we talk about? Well, by 2022, the number of smartphone users in the U.S. is estimated to reach over 270 million people. Effectively, a great part of our population. I think so, cell phone penetration in this country is currently estimated about 75% of the, of the population. That's about typical for most Western countries. Even the poorest of countries in, in some continents, you're, you're typically looking at about 45 to 50% still have mobile phones. So it's pretty clear. The global install base for smart speakers, that means they're in a home, they're turned on, not sold, but install of the various devices by the end of this year, we'll exceed 200 million units. That's almost double in one year. That's, that's probably one of the fastest adoptions of new technology that we've ever seen. I mean, it gets very little attention, but it is pretty amazing how fast this is being rolled out and how cheap it is. This is a Google uh, Cloud Center. We often talk about the cloud, right? You're keeping your, your documents in the cloud. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're actually just keeping it in somebody else's server. It's not the cloud, that actually is probably one of their mega data centers somewhere in the United States. Google processes more than 63,000 searches every second. 5.6 billion searches per day worldwide. Pretty amazing, right, how fast information. I like to say sometimes when I talk about technology, I don't think people are getting dumber. I think it's, everything's happening much faster, right? You gotta make decisions very quick. I mean we all find ourselves agitated at a store when things aren't happening quick enough. That's because technology is conditioning us to be very fast. 
Almost five billion videos are watched on YouTube every single day. That's a lot. We, in this room, we probably don't watch a ton of YouTube videos. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. If you're under the age of 30, you watch a lot of YouTube videos, right? Internet users worldwide are now spending over two hours per day on social networking platforms that includes messaging services. You can see since 2012 that number just steadily going up. I really find this interesting. Hope you all can see it on this side, but by age. Obviously you see in the, in the age group of 16 to 24, over three hours a day are being spent on social media. I doubt I, you know, I doubt I was present in school for three hours a day. During, during high school and college years. So I think we all see this, right? We all see this in our family members and our friends and you know, people running into you on the sidewalk that are looking at their phone. 75% of all internet users log into Facebook, so they have a Facebook account. With 2.3 billion monthly active users as the first quarter of 2019, 45% of American adults, whoops, say they get their news from the social media site, right? That's pretty crazy. So that's really bad if somebody like President Trump gets elected in 2016, then that's bad, right? Because people got this fake news from places. So that's really what we're seeing is, is starting to go on and what people are really talking about. YouTube, a lot of people, I'm always surprised, don't really realize that it's actually owned by Google's parent company, Alphabet. So Google and its entities own the number one search engine in the world and the number two search engine in the world. Uh, YouTube's the second largest. 1.3 billion people worldwide use YouTube. So, again, this is probably what typically most suburban homes now look like, right? Information coming in from multiple devices to multiple people at any one given time. Not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not here to say it's a bad thing. I'm here to say there's some things that are happening that we really ought to pay attention to. So what does this all mean, right? Great, more information, more critical thought, everybody getting smarter. Is that really what anybody in this room is seeing happening? Probably not. Information isn't coming in equally. The filters that we all you know, felt in the days of three net major networks and several major papers dissolved when we had the internet. You could type in a question in the search bar and get what they call returns to you, and you could find things, right? The information, everything was online. Google scanned every book and put it online. Great, we can find this information for ourselves, right? We can be our own filters now. That's kind of slowly not happening anymore, right? People that identify themselves as sinner, like, t oops, like Tim Pool here, have, has been routinely banned and censored, had videos taken down on YouTube. Uh, Amazon, increasingly people, uh, George Pearson just told me he was trying to find one the other day, couldn't find it on Amazon. Jordan Peterson is obviously one of the more visible conservative voices, repeatedly banned, demonetized is what they call it too on YouTube. Um, Mark Dice, who was just in the White House this week at the Social Media Summit, routinely censored. So there's obviously something happening if the results from people's searches are getting suppressed or getting outright censored. And coincidentally, most of them are moderate or center moderate or on the right. And so why is this happening? Why is it if you go to somebody's YouTube channel who's conservative, sometimes you see this. Video is not available. This is actually a, a search for Jordan Peterson video. Sorry, it's not available. You're not allowed to digest this information and make decisions about it yourself. Because somebody or some persons, or worse yet an algorithm, which we'll talk about in a minute, decided that this information wasn't something that you should digest. Was there, was there ever a conversation about that? No, these, these decisions are just being made. So this week, I think this, this speech was incredibly timing. I don't know if anybody paid attention to it, and uh, I want you to, is uh, there was a social media summit that President Trump held at the White House. He invited many of the people that we just showed uh, on, the, on the previous page that have been censored. Uh, he invited Silicon Valley people that were of the right side. I think there's only two that identify as conservative. 
that these people all came and talked to the White House about the things they're experiencing. And Peter Thiel, who's one of the famous, more conservative investors, has said that really Google needs to be investigated now. So there's a lot starting to come to head. Senator Cruz, who's actually been excellent on this issue. I beat up Senator Cruz a lot when I lived in Texas. But on this issue, I think he's been excellent. He's, he's really running the Senate hearings this week. If you watch today, uh, there's going to be more. But yesterday, especially, he really grilled a Google executive about this Project Veritas uh, report that got leaked this week or that got out this week from Google leaked documents. So this is starting to boil up. People are starting to notice hey, something's going on here. And so that's really what I want to try to explain to you today. So let's go back again. How did we find information, right? We researched it. We made decisions. We decided how to identify ourselves politically. I actually believe in the individual. I'm going to identify as this. I'm going to fight for individual rights. I'm going to be pro-business, whatever. You made decisions based on the information that you got. Increasingly in the technology age, we typed our questions in here and it was faster and easier. My God, I don't have to go buy a book. I can just, this information come to me and there, there seems to be five or 10 things on this Google page and I can read them all and I can decide for myself, right? So what's the problem with that? The problem is bias. We're all biased. Every single human being on the planet is biased. I'm biased. I'm a small old libertarian. I tend to vote Republican. I also vote on the left side of the aisle on occasion, so usually against somebody. But that's my bias, right? That frames how I view information. I'm not afraid to challenge it, but that's where I'm at. I have a religious bias based on the way I was raised, right? We're all like that. Everybody that works in Silicon Valley is like that. And so one of the problems starts to become in the computer world, bias is viewed as a software problem. And I'm not going to get too technical on you, but bias is viewed as a bug that needs to be fixed. So even when you type in bias in Google, you get a definition from Merriam-Webster on what bias is, but you also get this, Google's definition of bias, and you get little pictures and you can't really read it, but that says gender bias. And those are little nice little touchy-feely presentations about how bad really things like gender bias and transgender bias and all these things we hear are, right? So just typing in the word bias in Google leads you down a primrose path of how bad certain beliefs are, okay? You're not necessarily of the filter anymore. You're not just being given objective information. You're, you're being given information that's curated for you, right? You're probably not going to find Milton Friedman if you go search for economics. You're probably going to find Keynes and these other people, right? Why is that? Because human beings with bias are programming the algorithms that service up this information. And that's really the point I'm going to hit home a couple times. I'm not going to bore you with too much technical detail, but this is kind of an important slide from a technology standpoint of where we are. You know, we've all heard the term artificial intelligence, right? And robots, right? We all know robots. We joke about them a lot. I mean, this is where we were in the 1950s, learning how to program machines to do things for us, right? We have the computer because there was those rooms of big computers that just got progressively smaller. Now we're in the era of what they call machine learning. Right? Machine learning means this machine is going to learn how to do its job better over time, right? That's a concept that's really radically changing the aviation business. So these things aren't bad. It's just a question of what happens with them. And then what's predicted next is what we call deep learning. That's when you hear things like AI and neural networks and machines kind of deciding for themselves, right? Where People are busy in Silicon Valley and other places training machines how to think. You've seen the famous videos of the little robot head that can have a conversation with you, right? Well, in the future, we're going to see, you know, artificial beings or machines that can relatively think for themselves. Again, great for the aviation sector, right? A lot less people, especially, can make safer planes. We want that, right? But do we want devices? thinking for ourselves when it comes to information. That's, that's a far different problem. So how does Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these guys address bias, right? So when I'm talking about algorithms and bias, 
I'll, I'll just use a really easy example. And this really happened in the early 2000s and Google was developing its search bar. One of the ways they tested it was they used the term Jewish. And to their surprise, you know, really their horrification, it returned all this white supremacist information. And they're like, my God, how does this happen? Well, it turns out they happen to use that word more. So people looking for, say, Jewish thought or famous Jewish offers would use the word Judaism, right? So Google was figuring out, well, so that we don't want to give those people this bad information, right? So they trained the algorithm not to serve up the white supremacist information. And we can all applaud that, right? Because, yeah, we don't want to see that stuff. That's hate speech, as we were taught in the 90s. Well, so now, fast forward, we're in a room of dangerous individuals because we're talking about liberty. And you're often labeled, as the people I showed you, for talking about things like liberty online. If you use the hashtag liberty in a tweet, and Twitter has admitted this, the reach or the ability for that message to go out on the world is limited. Liberty is a bad word to Google and to Facebook. And that's why they're trying to game the algorithm that's giving you information to make it fair. That's, and you're like going, well, 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 wait a second. That's not computer programming, right? That's not machine learning. That's not. Well, the, the tell is, they're trying to make software unbiased by being biased. This is from a Google presentation. I worked for Google partners many times in my life. This is from an internal training document that they give to their developers. The Google training team are actually social workers, people that do diversity training, people that do things like this. Again, not bad on its surface, but these people are training developers to make sure software, which dictates things like what do you find when you search for things, based on these principles. How to engage, open, oops, openly address issues of racism, social class, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, and all forms of cultural prejudice and intolerance. How to anticipate what somebody, and they're talking about what you're looking for you know, on Google, all right? How to anticipate potential negative and unintended consequences. In other words, you're searching for something, we don't want you to see the bad stuff. We don't want you to read about Milton Friedman, he's a bad, greedy guy, right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about hate speech. We're talking about suppressing results of people that are talking about concepts of capitalism, of freedom, of all these things. Center, center is one of my favorite political correctness words. Center the voices and experiences of those communities who often bear the burden of these negative impacts. So what does that really mean? Centering means I don't want people to talk about liberty, so we're gonna make sure you see socialism, right? Because we gotta center, we gotta wait, we gotta skew the results, we gotta tip the scales over here on the left side because otherwise, too many people are finding out about this other stuff over here. That's really what we're talking about. This is how tech workers, programmers, coders are trained in Silicon Valley. I, I think that cannot be stated enough how frightening that is. Because again, um, this is a woman who's very interesting. She was actually the chief technical advisor to, to Vice President Biden. So this is a person on the left that we're talking to. Brilliant woman, worked for the CIA. She was uh, brought into Facebook to run their elections integrity division. Uh, sounds kind of <laughs> <laughs> Eastern European, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, in my six months at Facebook, where I was hired to be the head of global elections integrity operations in the company's business integrity division, I participated in numerous discussions about the topic of bias. I did not know anyone who in intentionally wanted to incorporate bias into their work, but I also did not find anyone who actually knew what it meant to counter bias in any true and methodical way. So we really have, going back to the Yellowstone analogy, good intentions going away. We have computer programmers that are programming an algorithm 
which will help you find things online, help you find things on your phone, help you find things when you ask your smart speaker what the Second Amendment is, right? An algorithm is running behind the scenes, helping you find that information. But we have people that are programming that algorithm who are purposely injecting their bias into the equation to try to create some sort of fairness. They're bringing coyotes in to try to, re to keep the elk population at a minimum. That's happening behind the scenes. Yeah? Something that came from the hearing the other day. Uh, Dennis Prager, they did a Prager U five minutes on the Ten Commandments. It was flagged so they wouldn't get past parental guidance because thou shalt not commit murder. Yeah. So actually, to take it further, Prager University <coughs> was labeled a Nazi institution internally at Google, and developers were told to censor the results of anything related to Prager University online. It's the same thing that happened to Jordan Peterson. Actually, the first two people this happened to was Louis Farrakhan and Alex Jones. And everybody said, yay, those people are crazy. We don't want to see their stuff, right? Well, then it starts happening to other people. And the thing, I didn't put it in the slide, but one of the scariest things to me is the left has really abandoned its position as defending free speech. I think those of us in the room that had friends on the left side of the aisle, I always admired that. As a small L libertarian, freedom of speech is pretty important <laughs> to the fabric of our, of our country. And when we started picking and choosing which amendments we liked over others, this is the situation we're in. You don't, you don't see the left or the ACLU or anybody defending Prager University, right? You don't see anybody trying to defend Jordan Peterson. That's, that's a little scary when the left has really retreated from their role of doing that. So surely there are rules, right? I mean, <laughs> Silicon Valley's just not running out there playing in the dark with all this stuff, are they? <coughs> well, most of us know there's laws of robotics. Uh, some of you in this room may have read pulp science fiction in the, let's just say, a long time ago. And, and we're familiar with Isaac Asimov, and he created the three laws of robotics in his fiction, but they've actually become commonly accepted principles so that robots, when we build them, they don't kill us. Um, I'm not convinced about robot cars yet, but we can, <laughs> we can discuss that. So what about algorithms that I'm talking about? Are there laws of AI? I, I was tempted to say if anybody got this right, I would give them an a, a Amazon Alexa device, but there's actually no laws of a, AI. The EU, our good friends and their infinite wisdom, uh, have, have created these that, we should, that should be accepted globally uh, because the EU is really good about convincing their own members of, of what to do. But look at these, what do these sound like to you? Human agency and oversight robustness and safety, <laughs> privacy and data governance, at least they said privacy should be, D diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, transparency, social and environmental well-being, and accountability. We're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about computer code, and what's been interjected into this discussion. All these human, left-leaning biases about the fairness doctrine, really. And so that's a little frightening, and you can kind of take a so what about it. Yeah? This is fascinating. I'm, I'm observing the same thing myself. I'm an engineer with Boeing, but I, I do a lot of internet work. The question I have for you is in the evening, I will go look on YouTube because I get a lot of really good information. But I've noticed a lot more posting of left word videos and stuff, although once in a while you'll start seeing, for example, a Donald Trump speech. Right. By your observation, how is YouTube? I'm sorry. That's okay. How is YouTube um, responding to the uh, the very same thing you're talking about? Are they are they pretty fair or are they leaning? Well, actually, YouTube's responding by doing what you're noticing. They're serving videos. They're serving information. It's called a suggested search. So if I'm looking for Thomas Sowell on socialism. 
you'll probably see, and this is an experiment I want you all to go home and do, you'll probably see things like AOC talks about socialism, Bernie Sanders, right? It seems innocu innocuous at the time. Well, then why are they giving me this junk? And algorithms aren't perfect. We're in the heyday of them being programmed right now. But you're starting to see YouTube, again, it's this balancing act that they're trying to do. They're trying to play God in the algorithm oh, oh. because at the end of the day, they'd really rather you not watch the Donald Trump speech. <laughs> what, what's interesting, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. My observation is that, you know, there used to be a lot more balance, but if you were leaning right, you could watch more rightward stuff. But they seem to want to inject, like you say, this more leftward stuff. I didn't want to watch it all. I thought, well, I'll wait the time to see if they totally eliminate all right-wing videos or whatever. So I just was curious to see what you. Well, if you watch, if you watch the Project Veritas video that's been released this week, and this was the point Senator Cruz was really grilling the Google exec about, um, who's a former bureaucrat at the federal level, by the way, um, they show an internal leaked document from Google, and they literally have a bar. And they show on the bar, we got to weight this side of it because we don't want, I mean, they're, you know, the funny thing is, is this is their own words. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to see this. It's one reason I'm kind of a dorky guy that I have stock in these companies because I like to see the annual report. I actually like to see what their patent filings because it really tells you a lot about where they're going. And so it's smoke and mirrors, right? I think censorship isn't the big issue. I think bias is the big issue, and this is what I'm trying to make sure I drive home to you all today. So, oh, here's a fun one. Did you know that you can't sue Google? <laughs> it's true. Google's immune from a lawsuit. The section, uh, Ted Cruz actually mentioned that in his hearing. Um, Section 230 of the 1996 Communication Decency Act exempts online services from liability for user-generated content. Facebook, Google especially, but they've all tried to hide behind this. And what they're saying is, and it, I was in D.C. in 96 when the Telecom Act was written. I knew Senator Dole's staff that pretty much wrote that. This was an offshoot. This was a carve-out to help at the time, really AOL and some of the fledging search engines. They're basically saying, look, we're going to go find all this information and give it to people, but we can't be sued for liability because we might accidentally post something that, you know, somebody gets offended by. Everybody says, well, we're just worried about the, at the time, the 96 Act was bad cable companies, good phone companies. We got to, so nobody really paid attention to the search engine people. They were small little businesses, and this was their little carve out. So literally, if Google censors you, if Google serves you something that you're offended, Google's immune from a lawsuit. So I'm not here saying we need to regulate these tech titans. If anything, I'm saying we probably ought to deregulate and look at the crony capitalism that has led to defense contractors like Facebook, Google, and all these others, which are international defense contractors, international government contractors, from having this kind of power over the information that's coming into our homes. I want to skip ahead again. So again, we're going back to the, the search bar. We're, we're seeing evidence that there's clear skewed results. If you guys use a Google search bar, I really encourage you to go home and do this at home. Type in something. What is feudalism? What is socialism? What is, who is Milton Friedman? Do it in a Google search engine. If you know how to do it in another one, and there are other ones, see what the results are. It's kind of interesting because this is the pattern I want to make you aware of. I want you to make aware of it when you're talking to friends and family that are probably more connected to devices than you are. Talk to them about it. This is what's missing. We're not talking about, and frankly, we're not marketing the cause of liberty very well if a hashtag about it can be su suppressed to this way. And everybody thinks that that magically is okay. So where's this going? Why is this so scary? So again, think of television, internet, search engine, Google where we are now, phone, to this, smart speaker. Excellent book, by the way, if you want to make note of it. Talk to Me was written by, a, I think he's a Wired Magazine journalist that really went out and interviewed developers of what's, you know, what's 
the AI that's going into what we call smart speakers. Again, code to watch out if it says smart in front of it. Uh, this is what's really going to change everything. Because I think you got my point when I brought it up earlier. When I type into a search bar, what is free market capitalism? Google at least gives me a whole bunch of results, right? Well, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, used to say that's actually a bug. That's a software glitch. We want to give you one answer. We should give you the right answer every time. That's how a software engineer thinks of the world, and that's fine. That's fine. Those are good software engineers. But that's not how I want my information. That's not how I want my daughter to find information, right? I don't want this device serving what's called a one-shot answer, which is all you're going to get. You're not going to get, hey, you should go research these books, Steve. You're going to get, oh, I found this answer. That's, that's where we're headed. Smart speakers going in homes, 200 million of them by the end of the year in the United States alone, are designed and programmed to give you one answer to whatever it is you need. That's fine if you're asking what's the capital of France. You would expect a smart speaker to tell you Paris. It's not fine when it's more complex ideas that require critical thought process. I think that's a reason why critical thought processes are not taught in school anymore. And if you look at that combined with the omnipresence of technology, that's a bad recipe. I really, I really tried hard not to be too Orwellian here, <laughs> but we're, I really fundamentally believe we're seeing the rise of the, of the technocrat. We're seeing people in Silicon Valley making decisions about what information we can and can't receive without any public discussion about it. And frankly, all of us don't really know or have a say in it, right? So I'm not saying we gotta go regulate these guys. What I'm saying is there's a reason why we're probably not having an ethics discussion about bias, about algorithms, about artificial intelligence. There's a reason we talk more about robotics then we talk about the computer code that underlies all the things that we say and do and receive. And that's the thing that we've got to be aware of. At least aware to start recognizing the pattern and hearing these things. So I wanted you to think of, when you hear these words, <laughs> you ought to be really paying attention because these are keys to what I'm talking about here. Bias, obviously, we talked about, uh, sorry, demonetize, deplatform. This is what's happening to conservative voices, specifically on YouTube. They're being, their search results, when you're looking for them, are being suppressed. There's a lot of information that they're providing themselves online about it. They aren't, don't have the ability to make money. Um, a good way to see this is Mark Dice is a guy I follow. He's got a video on vaccinations, three million views. You type in for videos on vaccination, you typically serve to CNN one. It's got like 10,000 people have watched the damn thing, right? So why is YouTube presenting me that video when three million people have watched this other one, right? It's obviously not based on numbers. It's based on, well, we think you ought to be watching this video, right? That's a discussion we need to have. If these guys are broadcasters, and they're filtering the information that we receive, then we need to talk about them in terms of being broadcasters. If they're not search engines and just providing us information, then they shouldn't be able to enjoy the immunity that that law provides them. Smart speakers, virtual assistants, we talked about it. Those sounds so good, right? I, wanted, I want the refrigerator to tell me when my, I'm out of milk. But I can guarantee you the refrigerator is not going to tell you much about David Hume or Thomas Sowell or about anybody else, right? And that's the world that we're getting to. One answer, one shot is not enough to talk about complex philosophical ideas around economics, around liberty, around any of those things. It's, that will never work. And then certainly pay attention when we hear things like AI, machine learning, and we hear executives from Google and Facebook talk about how they're going to make your life better. That's, that's the new code for the governments here to help you, right? <laughs> Silicon Valley making your life easier should almost trigger the same type of feeling. And finally, I had to end this with uh, John Todd Knight's favorite Thomas Sowell. The left's vision is not only a vision of the world, but also a vision of themselves as superior beings pursuing superior ends. 
The self-flattery of the vision of the left means that mere facts are unlikely to make them reconsider, regardless of what evidence piles up and regardless if it, of its disastrous consequences. Our only awareness of the huge stakes involved can save us from rampaging presumptions of our betters. So long as we buy their heady rhetoric, we are selling our birthright of freedom. So are we really talking about technology? I think we're really talking about the same tired left agenda that has crept into academia in the 60s, that waged war against our cultural institutions in the 80s and 90s, and is now firmly in control of the Silicon Valley industry. That's something that we need to pay attention to and you need to be aware of. It likes to get stuck on Thomas Sowell quotes, which I, I uh, So since it's just gonna stick there, we're gonna leave it up there. And I wanted to save time for Q&A. Again, I, I tried not to delve deep too much on the tech layer. If anybody wants to talk about that with me afterwards, by all means. But I, I, really what I wanna drive home is there's a pattern here and you're starting to see enough people say, hey, pay attention to this, that I think everybody in the room needs to know this is happening. So okay, open up to questions. Got, uh, three hands that have already been raised. I'll start with them and work first those three, and then we'll see how much time we have left. Maybe a quick hand. Thank you very much. Can you uh, discuss the difference between a uh, platform and a publisher? And so are some of these companies are crossing that line and what's going to be the consequences that they do? It's a great question. So fundamentally, what's the difference between a platform and a publisher, the consequences of those? Unfortunately, through decades of regulation, right, different industries enjoy different privileges or different regulations. Publishers have a different set of standards, right? Fair broadcasting, all these litanies of things that the FCC controls, talks about radio, television, print, right? This is a big issue when it comes to political campaign advertising, right? Because of what I mentioned earlier, that those doctrines and those regulations actually don't apply to the platforms of Google, Facebook, Twitter, right? These are called platforms because they're basically a tech tool that you get onto, like a platform, right? And they provide it. A publisher is a little different. What we're seeing because of technology and particularly because of our phone is those are really merging. Uh, the Cato Institute uh, just released a, a piece this week that I was a little disappointed in, honestly. It didn't take the Project Veritas documentary very seriously, and it said all we're going to get out of this is bad regulation, so don't listen to this. Well, I was a little naive because, again, I'm not saying we got to regulate Google or Facebook like a broadcaster, but I also think, to Senator Cruz's point this week, if you're going to act like that, you know, if you're going to start regulating speech, then maybe you shouldn't enjoy this special protection. I think this is a huge issue. Why the FCC isn't talking about it, why we aren't having open discussion or dialogue about this going on, well, I can tell you why, but that, that, that's the concern. Is we, this, is a, this is a national ethics conversation that we should all be engaged in. And I think this manufactured outrage for profit, as some people like to say, keeps us from that. And so one of the things I think rooms like this, we're in a good position to start talking to people about that. You know, a, a great example, there's a, there's a very large privately held company headquartered in Wichita, Kansas. They're the number two customer of Amazon Web Services. I would think a customer with that buying power probably ought to start asking questions about the way the Amazon Alexa device is being handled, right? We have power. Uh, I've, uh, Dave Wozniak, I didn't put the slide in, but Dave Wozniak, who was one of the founders of Apple, recently joined the Get Off Facebook movement and has really spoken out against smart speakers. He, he thinks you've got to be crazy to put one of those in your house. So there's people from the inside that are starting to come out. I, I, I don't know the answer really to your question, but obviously if they behave as broadcasters, if they carry political ads, we already have established rules that probably we probably ought to look at. But we're, we're seeing a world where those things are merging, and so what is a publisher anymore anyway? I mean, you know, the, the death of the fourth estate from self-inflicted wounds, in my opinion, really caused this. If we had journalism of any kind of degree that we used to have, and I guess you'd have to go way back for that, I, I think these questions would be raised, and they're just, they're just simply not. Yes, uh, thank you. This is good. The uh, 
2016 election, there was kind of a consensus that Hillary Clinton was the lead candidate and so on, and uh, maybe Silicon Valley uh, kind of ignored that. Uh, there's some that talk about how they now have four years, or will have four years of the best software engineers working diligently to try to affect the election. A uh, question to you is, um, at what point can they play enough of a role in an election to affect the outcome? That's a, I think that's an excellent question. The 2016 election was clearly the seismic event that brought a bunch of this to light. I think it's the event that really triggered the left into high gear, saying, oh shit, this election had to have been a fraud. There can't be that many people that support Donald Trump. These people are stupid, they're Nazis, whatever. We just, we have to figure something out. And I think that's when you start seeing the, the scales of bias, in a sense, being tipped. Uh, so you're absolutely right, and it, it, it's, it's a little frightening. One of the things that Google needs to be asked, and Peter Thiel mentions this this week in his comments, is uh, Google is a defense contractor to China. They've worked on China's closed social network system. If nobody's followed it, China's doing a very interesting thing. They're tying credit to social media. It's called the social credit system. And so basically, everything you do in the eyes of the party is monitored. So you want to get a, I mean, it's not like you're going to get a loan anyway in China, but no matter what you are doing and applying for, you're looked at. Google actually, and a lot of Silicon Valley helped develop that, right? Google at the same time turned around and discontinued a search program with the Pentagon. We have plenty of others, but you know, what Teal's point is, is why is it okay to work for China and not that? I think we got to look at that. In terms of elections, uh, you know, social media clearly moves the needle on elections. I've been saying for a while, I think polling data is out, out, uh, you know, it, it's, it's outdated. I think social media is probably a little bit better way to see what's going on. Um, but the left's not going to let 2016 go. The Project Veritas video, which they actually sat down at dinner with a Google executive, and they got her to say a lot of things she shouldn't have said. And one of the things is she said internally in Google, we all realize that the 2016 elections can never happen again, and we got to do something about it. That's that's they've the, hundreds of people in Silicon Valley have said that same thing. So at what point do we not? take them at their word. They're actively trying to do that. I think what you're seeing is the, the starting to see the results of that. Videos on liberty, videos on free market thinking, videos on just pro-Trump videos, anything. That's bad, that's evil. Worse, you know, you get worse labels for that, for, for talking about it. Thanks for coming in. Um, you suggested that maybe Google isn't the best search engine you just think of those two or three others that maybe are more, yeah. more open? Yeah, good, good uh, example. In fact, if I had gotten my act together on a handout, I would have, I would have done those. There's one called DuckDuckGo. <laughs> funny, DuckDuckGo. <laughs> it's a funny name. Uh, but they don't, they don't track results. They don't report results. They don't put cookies on your computers, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you can even use Google, but you could search in the incognito mode, for example. There's things you can do. There's a lot of other browsers out there like Firefox and things like that. There's a lot of, I use one that's called Smart Search. It's, a, it's not the same as Google Smart Search, uh, but it's actually a browser called that. Uh, what, you, what you're looking for is a browser that doesn't track your data. Data is really what's underpinning all this, right? They're collecting data on you. And data's fine if you want to log back into Amazon and you want Amazon to remember that you wear a size nine shoe, right? Well, that's great use of data. That saved my time, right? What we don't want is data being tracked about political thought or all that stuff. I, I didn't go into it, but the stuff on smart speakers and in that book I mentioned is really interesting. One of the applications that's being developed is to use the Alexa bot, as they call it, or device as a marital aid. Because Alexa's in your home, it's listening to all your conversations anyway, and so now the Alexa bot could actually be a therapist on the spot and suggest that you should talk to your wife in a different tone. <laughs> so I, I, I think all of us can agree that's a great use of technology. <laughs> and uh, nothing, surely what, what could, bad could happen from that, right? See the, uh...
most people in the room probably don't realize, but uh, each week we, we spend ten dollars on Facebook to advertise our programs. And about a year ago, uh, I was forced to show us as a political club, and I can't put that on there unless it says paid for by John Todd. So, yeah, it's interesting. So, you're a dangerous. Uh, you're a very dangerous individual. It's, it's interesting also that uh, they're using this as a tool to both write, rewrite history in a political correct manner. Question I have for you though equality of, offer, equality of income that is being pushed by Silicon Valley. Is Silicon Valley a free market or the socialist? Well, that's a that's that's a big question. I think one of the things you always got to remember about Silicon Valley, and I lived in San Francisco for four years, is Silicon Valley is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Most of these people that we view as these anointed programmers and developers went to Stanford or West Coast schools. There's a reason why the left went into the educational establishment first, going back into the 60s. We're seeing the generational fruit to be born of that. Uh, Silicon Valley is a very collectivist mindset. They think that technology can solve the world's problems. If you look at Eric Schmidt, former Google CEO, he's great because he actually goes to Bilderberg meetings and he'll, he'll give interviews and he even wrote a book about where this is all headed. And he talks about making families and neighborhoods and cities and nations safer and more efficient. I think, I think if anything, there's just a lot of naivete in Silicon Valley where they think they look at things as software codes that have bugs that need to be fixed. It's an engineering mindset combined with influence from a collectivist liberal ideology. And that's what we're looking at. The, the problem has been never so much damage could ever have been done, right? If you look at my slides going from newspaper, radio, TV to Google to devices in your home, unfortunately you can do a lot of damage with a bad philosophical political mindset. And so that's really what I'm trying to get everybody to pay attention to is the, where this is going is not good. The current polls say that millennials, uh, about 45% think socialism is pretty cool. So uh, dangerous individuals like you, John, yeah. you know, probably shouldn't listen to you because you're not cool. You're not cool enough. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can laugh, we can call people stupid, we can get in arguments on Facebook, right? But the reality is the genius of the left is, as Thomas Sowell says, they keep trotting out this same playbook decade after decade, failed experiment after failed experiment. Well, guess what? They've never been in a speaker in our home before. Yeah. And that's, that's what you gotta start paying attention to. The quality of income to me, that's just a code <laughs> for the fact that Silicon Valley knows that 25% of our jobs are gonna be wiped out because of automation. And they're trying to figure out all these people living on the streets of California. I mean, we've all seen what's happened, mm -hmm. right? Well, if we just pay them a basic income, magically gets called. Austin, Texas is going through the same thing right now. I think universal basic income, minimum wage, these are just, this, this is, frankly, it's smoke and mirrors. I just, I, I don't, I think the real issue is control in decision making. Who makes the decision? Who gets to decide what's the one right answer that your smart speaker gives you? I mean, I think that's, if anything, that's the point I want to leave you today. So I think we've got to wrap up. I want to thank everybody for their time again. And, uh, Let's give him a good hand. Thank you.